Hey, good morning, Pulpit Rock. It is good to see you all in the room, and it's also good to see you online if you're joining us. Let's all stand together, and uh, let's open up with a great old hymn. Let's sing it together. know this, let's lift it up. Oh Lord my God, when I know someone to concede to who own the world's I hands have me, I see the sky, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. can take it in that on the cross I could gladly bury me but it died to take away my sin and saves my soul my Savior God to be how great thou art how great thou art and saves my soul Savior God to be how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be. See, you are how great you are, how great you are. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be how great thou art. shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great you are then sings my soul my Savior God to me how great thou Thou art, who sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Who sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great You are, how great You are. Who sings my soul, my Savior God. All right, just the voices. Then it sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Let me hear you. How great thou art. Then sings my
that'll sound awesome. You can have a seat. Y'all do sound awesome. It's good to be with you this morning. If you're joining us online, glad you're here. Glad you're here in person. Um, I'm excited about this morning. If you were here last week, we had Yimmy come and preach, and uh, that was fam- fabulous. Uh, I was about to combine two words there, but um, let's just say fabulous. Next week, we're excited to have Laura Parker, the CEO of the Exodus Road Modern Day Abolitionists, joining us, and she's going to be preaching. In two weeks, we're going to have Danny Ortley, singer-songwriter, um, and a, a guy I went to high school with way back in the day. But today, I am super excited because we have Caitlin Shess with us again. Um, she was here in December. She is an author. She is a podcast host. If you, I tell you, if you only listen to one Christian podcast, it should be the Holy Post podcast, and she is on that. Um, I can't tell you how many times something has happened in the news, and then I've turned on the Holy Post podcast to hear like just really good perspective on it. Um, So she is on that. She's also a student uh, getting her PhD at Duke Divinity School PhD or yes, something like that. Um, Last December, she came and she preached at our church and uh, she has the record for the most downloaded sermon in pulpit rock history. Um, uh, and I, there's no prize. I don't mention that because there's a prize. Um, like there's the satisfaction of doing that. But uh, more than that, I think what it uh, speaks to is just the depth of insight and wisdom that she has. And so I'm super excited to have her share here in just a few minutes. Would you welcome her this morning? Thank you. And now, would you welcome each other? Would you stand and just say hello to someone sitting by you? Christ 
has broken every chain Broken every chain Sing this with me In Jesus' name we'll break every stronghold Freedom is ours when we call His name Jesus' name above every other All hail the power of Jesus' name Sing that again Jesus' name will break every stronghold Freedom is ours when we call His name Jesus' name above every other Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. I will call upon the Lord for He he is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord. For He alone is strong enough to save. Your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain, broken every chain, it's broken every chain. believe that? Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. Broken every chain. But does it feel like that all the time? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, we've said this here before, that we worship these songs we sing. Sometimes they're songs of truth about who God is. Sometimes there, it's truth about what God has done in our life. And sometimes it's who we need God to be, right? Because life doesn't feel like that sometimes. We're going to sing a new song, newer song. And um, I want you to take a posture of, of that. Think through that. I'm singing about this firm foundation and this God that will not fail. And that could be true in your life now or true in your past. Or maybe it's the God you need him to be, um, which is still true. Maybe like for me this morning, I'm singing it as an intercession for someone else that's going through something. So it's my way to pray for them, to worship for them, because they don't have the strength to do that. So as we engage this, I want you to think about that posture that you take um, in these lyrics. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken 
Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful to generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't Well, I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own stream Cause I've built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down Faithful in every season, so why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never let me down. He's faithful to generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't He won't this together. Rain came and went, blew over my house was built on you, and I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Rain came and went, blew over my house was built on Everything around me is shaking well, I've never been more glad well, I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful in every season yeah. 
so why would he fail now he won't he won't he won't fail he won't of who you are and walking with you, Jesus, uh, that you don't fail us. I pray uh, for each and every journey and story in this room, watching online, um, and those that we know that aren't, uh, that those words could lift them up and they could be true for them this morning, uh, that you will not fail and you will see them through. As we open your word uh, this morning, God, transform our hearts. Um, give us, pivot our thinking. Help us see the kingdom the way that you see it. Um, and we ask all of this in the name of our, our Savior and our Lord Jesus. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. Um, as Jonathan said, I'm happy to be here again, and I feel like because I'm here for the second time, the first time you got like the best presentation, and I feel like the second time I can do something kind of weird. <laughs> um, one thing that you should know about me, if you don't know me, and many of you do not, is that I really genuinely love the weirdest stuff in the Bible. <laughs> I have found through trial and error and practice, that there is goodness to be found in the weird, the confusing, the sometimes seemingly actually bad stuff in Scripture if we trust God and we dive in. I say this to begin because I think if there's one thing you learn today about this passage I'm about to read, I want it to be that this passage is one of many in the Bible where I think we often miss the really rich, important, convicting, beautiful parts of it because we stop looking when it's weird. So we're going to see in this passage first a way of looking at the world, then a truth about who God is, and then a commission for us today. So let's start by reading it. The passage for today is Psalm 82, a psalm of Asaph. God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. So the obvious first thing going on here is what is going on with the gods? <laughs> I don't think we can even get into any of those rich, important theological things I mentioned earlier before we deal with what is obviously the weirdest part of this psalm. Your translations might have different things for the first line of this psalm. Mine says God presides in the great assembly and gives judgment among the gods, with gods in quotation marks. Some translations will say divine counsel instead of great assembly. Some will say gods with no quotation marks. Some will say rulers, human rulers, instead of gods. 
All of these different translations do not tell us that the Bible is some indecipherable, incomprehensible book, and all of our translations are just shots in the dark. What it does tell us is that the passage is strange and hard, and translators have struggled to figure out how to communicate what the words say. And we can imagine why this is a hard one for translators to deal with. They're imagining you reading it in your Bible, and what's the first thing that you learn in Sunday school besides Jesus is the answer to every question? There's one God, right? There might be idols, there might be false gods, other people worship, they don't even exist, right? There is one God. So what do we do with this strange psalm that opens seemingly with a worldview that we do not and could not hold? There are three main options for this particular psalm if you go out and pool all of the scholars who study this. The first option is the gods in quotation marks option. This says that the psalmist is operating under the assumptions of the surrounding nations, of Canaanite religion in particular, and he's offering a polemic, a criticism of them from within their own frame of reference. The psalmist starts out with their view of the world in which various gods rule over different regions or areas of life are gathered together in a council. This is something they thought, and he takes that worldview and uses it to display God as the ultimate ruler. That's the quotation mark option. The second option is the non-quotation mark option, just gods. The psalmist is describing reality as it really is. There are lower G gods, spiritual beings that govern the world under God's authority, and the psalmist is kind of pulling back the curtain of heaven and showing us what's happening behind the scenes. This is kind of like the first couple chapters of Job, right? We have this sense that Satan is trying to try Job, and there's a kind of divine counsel that this conversation is happening in. It's important for this view to note that the Hebrew word for God here, El in the singular or Elohim in the plural, is a generic term for God that doesn't mean Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't meet our theological definitions. When we hear God, we rightly bring all this theology, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator, redeemer, trinity, but this word doesn't include any of those things. It could be better communicated spiritual being or heavenly being, an angel or a demon, someone in that spiritual category. So that's the second option. The third option is the metaphor option. It was a traditional Jewish interpretation to see the gods as referring to Israelite rulers, and Christians have taken up this interpretation throughout history. The psalmist is using inflated language to refer to human judges or rulers. And this isn't just an out (laughs) to get out of a complicated passage. There's good biblical and theological reasons for this. Theologically, it's often true in scripture that divine and human rulers are connected. Biblically, this same word Elohim is used to refer to officials appointed by God in a couple of different times in Exodus. So that's the third option. You've got the quotation mark option, the non-quotation mark option, and the metaphor option. And we can see why this is complicated, right? I mean, try to imagine doing a flannel graph for kids of this scene. Like, who's in the council? What are they? What's going on? But here's the thing. I don't actually think we have to choose between these three options. One of the foundational things that I hope that you come away with today is this. The spiritual, political, and personal are never strictly separated in God's kingdom. Why can't the psalmist be referring to both spiritual beings and human rulers? Why can't this be both a polemic, a criticism, and also an actual description of reality? Many of us have been taught a way of reading the Bible that goes something like this. I have a question in my head. I go to my Bible. I open it up. I look for the right answer. I go away happy that I have learned information in my head, right? We treat it like an encyclopedia of religious knowledge or a moral handbook or an account of history with some spiritual goodies kind of sprinkled in. We are smart, rational people. We know how to read a book, right? My brain is a receptacle for knowledge. I find the right answer, I stick it in there, I go on my happy way, a better person. That is not how Christians have read the Bible throughout history, and I don't think it's how we should read the Bible. One of my favorite theologians, Karl Barth, wrote a famous essay called The Strange New World Within the Bible. Early in the essay, Barth writes, What is there within the Bible? What sort of house is it to which the Bible is the door? What sort of country is spread before our eyes when we throw the Bible open? He goes on in the essay to describe the wild and wonderful world of Abraham hearing the voice of God, of Moses and the Israelites wandering in the deserts, of Samuel trying to sleep, but God will not let him. What I love about this way of talking about the Bible is it describes it as a world into which we enter, where we find strange and uncomfortable things that do not match how we normally think about the world. 
So this is the first thing that we learn, this way of thinking about the world. And in verse 1 of this psalm, we learn something very important about God. This is the thing that we learn about God. God reigns. God presides. God judges. God is in charge. God reigns over all creation, the spiritual, the political, and the personal. The best way that I can describe this to you, this first verse, is to tell you a story about when I first went to seminary. When I started telling people I was going to seminary, I was not in a context where very many women did that. So most of the time when I said that, the answer I got was, why? What are you going to do with that? And probably 90% of the time I gave the same exact answer. This was many years ago. Don't fault me for what I'm about to say. My answer was, I don't know what I'm going to do. Anything but children's ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And so what did I do? Two days after moving to Dallas, Texas to go to seminary, I got a job in children's ministry. (laughs) Don't tell God or God's people what you will not do because you will immediately do it. (laughs) And I learned a lot in those first few years. I learned how much I love kids. I learned how important children's ministry is. I learned how hard it is. I feel like anytime I get to preach at a church, I should take an opportunity somewhere in a sermon to say, sign up to help with the kids. It is so important. I spent years of my life just like on the phone begging people to help. It is so crucial to the life of the whole church. And one of the early weeks in my job, I got a call on the walkie-talkie that one of our most experienced teachers and her helper, her younger daughter, were stuck in traffic and running late. So I run over to a room of 15 four- and five-year-olds, just me. It was chaos. I mean, there was like running and screaming. There was literally paint dripping down a cabinet. There were two little girls, I'm not making this up, yanking a baby doll between them. It was like very biblical chaos and violence. And I entered in, and I was like, I am in charge. I'm going to put my foot down, and I'm going to take control of I'm experienced. I'm an adult. I know what I'm doing. I might as well have been invisible. They did not care at all. And so I'm going through these, like, what felt like hours was probably a few minutes of humbling chaos in this room. And I'm not joking about this either. My back was turned to the door, but I could tell you the moment their teacher walked into the room. It was, like, silent. (laughs) the baby doll was dropped. Like, everyone knew who was actually in charge. It was not the 22-year-old that had no idea what they were doing. God sets the standard for authority in this passage. The nations around them had an idea of the gods up in heaven fighting with each other. Maybe they were sleeping with humans. They got into all of this chaos and mischief. And when God enters this scene at the beginning of the psalm, it's like that silent There's no question about who's in charge. It's not whoever wins the latest fight. God is in charge. God sets the standard for all authorities, and God's standard is justice. Verse 2 begins God's judgment with a question. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? How long is a constant cry of the Bible? How long will you hide your face from me, God? Psalm 13 asks. Habakkuk asks the same. How long will I cry for help, God, and you will not listen? When God gives Isaiah his calling, his command to go prophesy something very unpopular to his friends and neighbors, Isaiah asks a reasonable question. How long? That little question puts words to our deep and abiding sense that this is not how things are supposed to be. The world is broken. Something is deeply corrupted. Humans are fallen. We abuse and exploit each other. We hurt each other when we aren't even trying to. We get sick and we die. This world that is supposed to be our home is wrecked with earthquakes and floods. I mean, it goes from the really big stuff. Nations go to war against each other. A global pandemic kills hundreds of thousands of people to the smaller stuff. My family is fighting. My body hurts. My work goes unnoticed in the world. How long? Here, that really important question is not in the mouth of a human to God like it usually is, but in the mouth of God, the same God who later enters into our suffering in an even more important way. How long? The psalmist describes for us the reason the world is so broken. Sin has impacted not just our hearts, though it certainly has, but it has impacted all of creation. The spiritual beings who were supposed to rule the world justly instead allow exploitation and abuse. The human rulers who were supposed to exercise authority on God's behalf have abused their power. 
And then God moves from this question and condemnation to imperatives for rulers. Defend, uphold, rescue, deliver. God's standard for justice is not abstract. And God ruling in heaven is not unconcerned with the details of everyday human life. This is the justice God demands for his creation. The weak are defended, the orphans are taken care of, the poor and oppressed have people who fight for them, the weak and needy are rescued from wicked people oppressing them. This is what God demands of rulers, spiritual and earthly. These words should sound very similar to words all over scripture. This is in the law given to Israel, right, to care for the widow and the foreigner and the orphan. This is the demands given just a few psalms before in Psalm 72 to an actual human ruler. This is how you are to judge justly. These are the words Jesus says at the beginning of his ministry in Luke 4, what he has come to do, bring this kind of justice. And this demand for justice cannot be pushed off by us onto other people, onto the Uh, the spiritual realm or the higher up rulers on earth, the ones who have the real power. No, this standard of justice, of caring for the most vulnerable, is a standard that God gives for all authorities of any kind. And that includes us. Given in Genesis the command to rule and reign, to exercise authority over creation, this is a demand of justice from us. And that especially includes all of us today in 21st century America who have the opportunities and the resources to defend and uphold and rescue and deliver like no early Christian could have imagined. What does God say next? I'm going to read verse 5 again in case you've forgotten. It says, The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. There's a few important things to know about this verse. First, The gods are not dismissed as not real or even as unimportant. Their injustice is condemned. Their power is revealed as temporary, fragile. But the significance of God showing up in the divine council and calling out the gods is that they are real and their power affects people. Whether we're thinking about spiritual beings or human rulers, and again, I think we're thinking about both. There's no easy separation in scripture. They have power in the world. This is similar to the language the New Testament will use of powers and principalities, of dominions, of the authorities. The power that consumerism and nationalism and racism have in our world, they are real things. They have real power. The way that money and wealth can corrupt human hearts, the way that institutions get captivated by injustice and end up exploiting people instead of serving them, the way that families get broken apart by fears hijacked by our political system, the powers are real. They harm us. They harm the most vulnerable especially. And this is why verse 5 tells us the foundations are shaken. The world was not supposed to be this way. The moral order God built into his creation, those foundations have been corrupted. Our ability to discern that moral order has been corrupted. They walk about in darkness. They know nothing. There are both spiritual and earthly causes of the instability and corruption in our world. Hear me say this. There are both spiritual and earthly causes to the corruption and instability in our world. There are policies There are broken systems and spiritual forces that hurt the vulnerable and prop up the powerful, and God calls it all out. The corruption in our world is cosmic. If you are looking around and thinking, this is broken and I don't think I can do anything to fix it, you are mostly right. This psalm should be a strange comfort to us because this is not how things were supposed to be. We are in desperate need of salvation. And we see a glimpse of that good news in verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read them again. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. There is no authority that rivals God's And when the lower authorities fail to bring the flourishing and wholeness to God's creation that they were intended to, they are judged and they will die. 
Interestingly, there's one time in the New Testament that Jesus cites this psalm, and it is, as you might expect, also weird. (laughs) The psalm is weird. Jesus' quotation of it is weird. I think this particular use of the psalm in the Gospels is a good example of one of my favorite categories of Jesus stories, where someone asks Jesus a hard question or confronts him with something, and then he just says something totally weird and walks away. In John 10, the religious leaders are preparing to stone Jesus for blasphemy. They literally have the stones in their hand. Jesus says to them, and I'm shortening this longer thing, he says, it is, is it not written in your law, I have said, you are gods, this psalm. If scripture cannot be set aside, why do you accuse me of blasphemy? Now, if we never came to this psalm because of how weird it is, we would get to that part in the Gospels and be like, what is going on? (laughs) He's accused of blasphemy, and he says, I said to you, you are gods. Like, what is happening? I think it makes more sense if we go back to this psalm. In this psalm, the standard has been set for who has rightful authority. God sets the standard, and the standard is justice. You uphold the vulnerable and the weak. You defend the defenseless. You rescue the weak and the needy. You have authority. You don't do that, you will be judged. And Jesus can say, as no one else ever has or ever will, as the religious leaders accusing him certainly could not say that he has met God's standard of justice. In his ministry on earth, he upheld the vulnerable. In his work on the cross, he rescued us. He defeated death. This psalm, Psalm 82, is just a small picture of something we will see blown up to even more cosmic proportions in the New Testament when Christ defeats the powers and principalities on the cross. We see a glimpse of the salvation that is coming in this psalm. The good news for us as Christians is that we can read it and know even more about what is coming, that he will defeat once and for all the powers and principalities. As we've said over and over again in this psalm, this is about the defeat and the downfall of both human rulers and spiritual authorities. There's no easy divide between the two of them. This is about the fall of any authority that is against God, any authority that does not fulfill God's intention for his creation. These two verses, verses 5 and 6, sound very similar to the account of the fall of the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. It might be a familiar story to you because a lot of Christians will see the fall of Satan in this passage. Again, spiritual powers, earthly powers, it's kind of hard to tell. In Isaiah 14, there's this description of a particular king, but also of spiritual powers falling. And here's some of these lines from Isaiah 14. This is verse 4 and then moving to 9. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon how the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. In verse 9, the realm of the dead below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who were leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. All those who were kings over the nations. They will all respond. They will say to you, you have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has brought you down to the grave. Along with the noise of your harps, maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. This is intense language to tell a very important point. Your injustice will not last. Your corrupted power will be your own demise. For all the pomp and circumstance, the wealth and power that you enjoyed on earth, you will be brought low. Like many passages in scripture, this is a frightening message for the powerful and a comforting message for the powerless. But in the end, it is good news for all of us. The false gods you serve that you thought would help you that have ended up failing you time and time again, they will die. Stop serving them. This I imagine this psalm in, with our own spiritual forces, the things that are common things that kind of grab our attention and our affection today. I imagine God standing before the false gods in this divine council, the false gods of power and wealth and control and racism and looking at all of them and saying, you are dead. Before the almighty God, you are mortal, you are weak, you are passing away. This passage also reminds me of another one that I get forced into talking about all the time. I didn't really choose it, but I spend most of my time talking and writing and thinking about Christians and politics. And so what is the one passage that everyone always asks about? Romans 13. 
We think that we know what this means. I told Jonathan earlier, we say Romans 13, everyone just kind of, we, I don't even have to tell you what verses I'm talking about. Everyone kind of knows Romans 13. Obey the government, pay your taxes. And I hate to break it to you, but it does kind of mean that. It does mean obey the government and pay your taxes. I think it means a little bit more than that, though. Sometimes we look at the Bible and we say we've got something like Psalm 82 on one end that's like down with the powers, and then we have Romans 13 on the other end that's like, no, actually, get along with them. And I don't think they're in opposition here. I think they're telling exactly the same story. I'm going to read to you the first couple of verses of that section just to kind of jog your memory of Romans 13. It says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. The first thing to note about Romans 13 is that it also does what Psalm 82 does. It frames divine power and earthly power together, spiritual power and earthly power together. In this context, it's in ways that we tend to think of as submissive or stifling, but by connecting divine and human rule, to say to the Roman Empire, your authority comes from God, is to say to the Roman Empire, your authority comes from Christ who you crucified. The Roman Empire demanded total allegiance. The emperor himself was worshipped as a god. So Paul is saying to the Roman Empire what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 82 that Moses said to Pharaoh that Mary said in her song that Jesus said to the religious authorities just a moment ago God rules over you it's the same story over and over again you powerful people you spiritual rulers you religious authorities you rule justly and you recognize where your power comes from or judgment is coming there is a day to talk about Romans 13 and political responsibility. I do it all the time. But I also think there is a day to say every unjust authority, the Roman Empire persecuting Christians, modern nations that harm the poor, spiritual leaders and pastors who put burdens on God's people, politicians who exploit fear and misinformation, leaders of institutions who exploit their power will be brought low. And Rome like Canaan and Babylon and the United States of America, will pass away. The corrupted human rulers, the corrupted spiritual authorities, they will die. Their power now, as great as it seems, is the last whimper, the last grasp for control of an empire that has already been killed. Have you ever seen someone who knows that their power is waning? Maybe it's a kid on the playground who realizes that they're not the cool new thing anymore. Maybe it's someone at your work who realizes that all the important projects are being pushed away from them. What do they very often do? They lash out, desperate for control, or even just to hurt someone on their way out. That's a way of thinking about all of those false gods and corrupt authorities on earth. They are lashing out, they are desperate for control, desperate to exert some kind of influence, and we often let them. But because those last grasps for power are so effective, because they really do hurt many of us, including the most vulnerable, the psalmist has a last word for us. I'm going to read verse 8. Rise up, O God, judge the nations, for all the nations are your inheritance. After God has been speaking for most of the psalm, the psalmist's voice pipes back up towards the end. They've gotten this behind-the-scenes look at the heavenly council. They've seen God calling the gods to account. But I just imagine after a glimpse of this kind of justice, this correction, this protection in heaven, any human being seeing that would cry out, as God did earlier, how long? How long until you bring this correction that you have done up in heaven down to earth? The language the psalmist uses here, rise up, it's the same language that is used in the prayer for when the Ark of the Covenant was moved from one place to the next. Moses said, rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. In other words, this is language that reminds us of God's presence with his people, his involvement in human affairs, his power to protect and provide for his people. This same word is used throughout the Psalms to call out to God, to cry out for him to intervene in the corruption and injustice on earth. And the psalmist also gives us a reason for this cry. 
the nations are your inheritance. This harkens back to Deuteronomy 32, where it says that God divided up all of humanity, set the boundaries for the nations, gave them their inheritance. It's another way of saying what the psalm has been saying all along. It is God who rules. The nations surrounding Israel who worshipped their own gods and went out and fought their own wars and thought they controlled their own destinies, they were wrong. The psalmist tells them, your gods are ruled by Yahweh. The boundaries of your nations determined by Yahweh. Your destinies, he has made them. The same needs to be said of us, of our nation, of our own kind of efforts at control and independence, of charting out our own futures. Ultimately, God is in control, and it should be good news for us, for his reign is just and merciful and righteous. This psalm, as I said earlier, gives us an imagination to think of the world and our own lives in a new way. It kind of pulls back the curtain of heaven and asks us to think about what's really going on behind the scenes. Then it tells us something crucially important about who God is, that he is reigning, that he is in control. And then it gives us a commission in verse 8 to hear and respond to God's call for justice, for we all exert authority, and then to join the psalmist in calling out to God for justice. First, to respond to God's call for justice. We can pursue God's standard for justice in our personal lives and our political lives. As we said at the beginning, there is no easy divide between what happens in your church, your family, your life in the world. We can serve the vulnerable in our families, at our job, in our communities. We can also call for justice from our actual rulers the way the psalmist does. We can partner with people in our communities to serve the poor and advocate for the vulnerable. But ultimately, while we can do all of that, we ultimately join the psalmist in crying out to God for justice that only he can provide. The end of this psalm actually sounds like the words Jesus taught us to pray. The psalmist sees the justice being done in the heavenly realm and cries out, make it so on earth. And Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the good news of this cry to God. There is an end to injustice. And until then, we pray and we work And we wait, we take this good news with us into the good works we do. When it seems hopeless, like the world is too broken to try anything good, the powers are too great to fight against, we can hold fast to the words of this song. In the face of everything broken and corrupt in the world, a broken political system, deep divisions in our communities, rulers of all kinds who seem incapable of doing the good they were told to do, it's easy to respond in one of two ways. First, we can stop trying. The powers are too large and powerful. The problems in the world are impossible to solve. It's not worth all this effort to keep fighting and failing. We give up. The second option, we resort to the world's tactics. If we fight dirty, if they fight dirty, we fight dirty. They're too powerful for us to just stay confined to the rules. They're too horrible to speak with compassion to them. They're lying and exploiting people to get what they want. The ends justify the means for them, so it should for us too. This psalm does not give us a cliche, simple answer. God is in control. No, it says to those two temptations, to stop fighting or to resort to the world's tactics, it says God has already won. You are free to work hard and work well. You are free to work even when it seems like it isn't working. You are free to work without cutting corners, without the ends justifying the means. You don't have to play dirty and you don't have to give up. You are free to fight for justice and serve your neighbors and pour yourself out for the marginalized without worrying that your efforts are in vain. We don't have to worry that the false gods of power and wealth and violence, as powerful as they seem, we do not have to worry that they will win. They will not. So as we wait, as we contemplate ourselves and our families and our communities, what we can do to fight for justice, to not do it by the world's tactics and to not give up, we first can start by praying as the Lord taught us, by orienting our hearts 
to the one who will ultimately bring justice, to remind us of that foundation that we are working off of, that God has ultimately won. So if you don't mind, would you pray the words of the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Just a doorway into a resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, I'll join you when you rise. And when you return to glory, all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. The song will be the same. Let his praise arise, Christ we make 
magnified me. Oh, Christ, be magnified, the author of my life. Christ, be magnified in me. Oh, Christ, be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ, be magnified in me. Oh, Christ, be magnified. The altar of my life. Christ, be magnified. I think this often, uh, I think this is always true of great theologians, is they do not just teach us uh, what Scripture means for us, but they teach us even how to think about Scripture. And I always think that when I hear you talk, Caitlin. So thank you for your gifts and for sharing them with us. Uh, that is just a gift to us. Can we thank Caitlin? And maybe this would be a good place for us to end as a benediction. Um, as Caitlin remind us, all authority comes from the crucified Christ who is already one. And so with the power that we have, may we defend the weak and fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Go with God. <laughs>